as a presidential decree was issued on Friday on the unification of command of the unified forces by President Salva Kiir and subsequently rejected by first Vice President Rep Machar, can the two leaders ever come to a consensus on the implementation of the peace agreement? Join us as we discuss this and more only on Beyond the Headlines. Our guest on the program is Mr. Edmund Yokani, the Executive Director of Community Empowerment for Progress Organization, abbreviated as CEPO. Welcome to Beyond the Headlines. Yeah, thank you very much for welcoming me for this show. And uh, yeah. Over a week ago, fighting erupted between SSPDF and SPLA-IO. This has led to the displacement of countless of civilian population. As a civil society activist and among the stakeholders, as well as a signatory to the peace agreement, is the peace agreement itself dead or is there a chance that it can be continue to be implemented since it seems like the situation looks so dire within the country? I uh, thank you very much. Speaking as one of the signatories on behalf of the stakeholders to the revitalized peace agreement, I will say the word dead may be very hard to qualify, but what I will qualify is that still there's a possibility to implement the revitalized agreement. And of course, you know, the revitalized agreement, if you read Article 1.5, read together with 1.9.6.1, which an institution established called presidency, the presidency institution is entrusted to implement the revitalized agreement in terms of decision. What, what does it mean? What, what, what do I refer to the presidency? I refer to a mechanism where it's chaired by His Excellency, the president, then deputized by the first vice president, and the other four vice presidents are members. So if you read the agreement, this particular mechanism is a complete 100% South Sudanese mechanism that was entrusted to have the primary responsibility of making decision for the implementation of the revitalized peace agreement. So if the presidency can urgently meet and make decision to bring a calm to the current tension among the IEO and the SSPDF and the other parties, that will really help. So still the uh, members of the presidency at their fingertips, they have obligation or they have opportunity to make decision that can still put the peace agreement to a right path if they really like it, because it's a question now of political will. It's a question of the level of trust and confidence among the members of the presidency. And if they personally have huge deficit in trust and confidence, then the country will suffer from that and they will subject the country to suffer from their level of mistrust and lack of confidence. But if they love the country to be peaceful, if they love to offer peace and stability to the citizens, then they need to urgently meet and make decisions before we blame anybody from outside, being it Traika, being it Agard, being it AU, or being it Argemic, or being it Sitsam, or being it any player. It is the primary responsibility of our leaders under the presidency to decide to put the peace agreement in the right path from now. There are those who would argue that the peace agreement itself, the revitalized peace agreement was watered down and it holds limited value in terms of strength of both parties to adhere to it. What factors do you believe triggered the negative military disagreements between the SPLA IO and the SSPDF? You know, the most challenging situation is that the security arrangement didn't win any trust and confidence among the members of the presidency. So the members of the presidency really have a fear to implement chapter two of the revitalized agreement, which is mainly around transitional security arrangement. And this begin with ensuring that ceasefire hold, after if ceasefire hold, then you need to unify the forces and unifying the forces, you have steps to undergo like containment of forces, barracking of forces, then sending the qualified forces training sites, train them, then graduate them, which in the agreement they term it as the necessary unified force of around 85,000 boots. So this particular process, it have never gained any political will from the leadership of the parties that signed the agreement or the members of the presidency. That's one of it. So what are the indicators that shows they don't have the will to demonstrate? In the middle, after delay of one or two years of implementing the chapter two, we start, see, we start beginning to see a trend of defections. And mainly the defections are from SPLIO to SSPDF. 
And if you read the agreement, chapter 2.8.1, it deny any party that signed the revitalized peace agreement to engage in recruitment of new forces. So if you see defections, defections technically, it is if, 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 if members of one party defected to join another party, and if they will come by the party that will come the that they, they, they decide to defect to, that defection is considered as a recruitment of new forces, which was actually condemned or subject not to be accepted by the agreement. So I've been sending defections from IU to SSPDF, and these defections have been embraced or been financed. And it is now the outcome of this defection because the defectors start turning their guns against their colleagues whom they have left under the leadership of Dr. Riyak Mashar under the IO. So you come to realize that most of the fighting are really fought by the defectors from IO to SSPDF, but also SSPDF have never stood up and stopped them from fighting. And you see these defections have gone for quite a number of uh, 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 period of time and end up having this agreement which was signed in Khartoum is called um, Khartoum Peace Agreement between the Kitigwang faction which declared defection from Riyak Mashar and form a different faction under the former chief of staff Simon Garwich and uh, one of the commanders along where he signed a Gwelek agreement. So you see that particular agreement triggered a lot of defections that have become more confrontational from S from uh, defectors of SPLIU to SSPD of start fighting their counterparts. And did what happened in Upper Nile and what was happening in some parts of Unity, Unity State. So this particular situation was triggered by making defection as sweet as fluid, and that have resulted to undermining of the peace agreement. So I will say in some parts of the country, the permanent ceasefire is not holding specifically around Maywood, Longuchuk, and you can also look around Pagak, the outskirts of these towns, the ceasefire is not holding, and actual SSPDF and, and, and SPLIO are in direct confrontation. And this is confirmed by the spokespersons of the two forces for the SPLM, uh, IU, that is uh, Lampol, and then for the SSPDF, Lulwai, all of them are exchanging information that they are already in a war with each other. And I think that for me, it's a violation of the permanent ceasefire in the parts of the country where they're confronting themselves. So that is a trigger. The trigger is that defectors start undermining the of the country from violence to peace through the implementation of the revitalized agreement. And I think they are aided by the uh, allies, which is SSPDF. And that's why for me, I feel still there's opportunity for the leadership of SPLAIO and SSPDF at the level of the presidency to meet and sanction defection and reject defections and call the ground commanders for discipline to respect the permanent ceasefire because we can't afford to return to war. And unfortunately, is that the leaders, president and first vice president, in several public events have promised the nation after signing the revitalized peace agreement in September 2018. They will not allow the country to return to war, but already some parts of the country are experiencing war, which is very disastrous. With the continued exchange of volatile words between the spokespersons for the SSPDF and the SPLA-IO, who is to blame for the military and political confrontation that is now taking place within the country? For me, the principles in the presidency, we should not blame anybody. We should blame the members of the presidency mechanism that they have not taken primary responsibility to stop this because all these acts are done under their leadership. And when you talk of authority, authority normally have a pick point and the pick point of authority in South Sudan, it's a president, it's a first vice president. So the two need to really stand up and stop this game from going on. So it's His Excellency the President and then His Excellency first Vice President to make decision. I think the other members of the presidency really do not have a big tech in this current developing situation. This current developing situation is really primary responsibility of His Excellency the President and the first Vice President to meet and stop the ground commanders from confrontation. The language of we're in self-defense or the language of we're being provoked, I don't think this is a language that allow war to continue this language, they have the responsibility to stop it. On Friday, President Kerr issued a decree on the unification of command of the unified forces, which was later rejected by Vice President Riyak Machar. Riyak Machar went ahead and released a press statement, and this is what he stated. On Friday, March 25th, 2022, President Selva Kiv Mayardi issued a presidential decree on the unification of command of the unified forces 
in which he relinquished three positions of command in the military and two in the National Police Services to the SVLM, AIO, and SOA. In his decree, the president also directed the chief of defense forces and the inspector general of police to immediately implement his order. However, it is to be noted that this is a unilateral decision. In light of the above, the SPLN SPLA IO Political Bureau would like to state the following. One, the unilateral decision by President Salva Kiir is a violation of the Arcus and is a clear rejection of the ongoing mediation process by the Republic of the Sudan, Chair of IGAD. Two, the SPLN AIO condemns and rejects the unilateral decision. Three, the SPLM AIO is committed to the ongoing mediation to solve the matter. What is your take on this situation? This is clearly the culture that usually they have, is that one party will move a step forward, another party will pull that step back. And of course, from the SPLIO perspective, with reference to the mandate, of the mechanism of the presidency in Article 1.9.6.1. If you look at the first section of that article, which is 1.9.6.1.1, uh, uh, it's where decisions are made in consensus under the presidency meeting. So this decree, it's supposed to be an outcome of presidency meeting. That means all the members of the presidency sit and then they reconstitute what you call the command structure. Because remember, when Brohan came to Juba, one of the outstanding issue with regard to implementation of chapter two is that the failure of the parties to centralize or to unify the command because you can't do anything in chapter two of the revitalized agreement without a unified command. So His Excellency President Salva Kirmayer did have issued this presidential decree as a sign of unifying the command structure because that's one of the outcome of the meeting with Brohan. But the SPLIO in personality of his excellence, the first vice president, believe that that decree could have come out as a result of consensus made under the presidency meeting, but they don't have the appetite to have the presidency meeting. So what will happen? Obviously, because there's no appetite for presidency meeting, decisions are going to be unilateral. And our worry is that this is the political culture usually they have, and this may lead us to a long period of extending again the lifespan of the revitalized agreement. But the question is, will they have the political will to deliver the agreement in order to transition the society from violence to peace? Or will they have a high will of making sure they don't transition the country to where they want through violence? Because violence is not an option that we support it. Whatever the case is, they need to sit, meet, and decide and stop violence and move in an honorable, peaceful way in terms of power transfer and transition the country from the situation we're in now to a political stability. What is the state of the security in terms of, is there risen tension in Juba itself? Is there free movement? What is the situation like? Are people fearful of what might happen next in terms of the escalation of violence taking place in Juba? In general, citizens are addicted to this political culture and military confrontation among our leaders since 2013 until now, but citizens are living in fear. You can honestly see in public uh, bus stations, in market, in shops, in churches, people, everybody expressing fear that we are worried at any time. 2016 situation may erupt in Juba. And simply, even you can see people also in uniform speaking the same language that we're waiting who will trigger and where will be trigger and who will direct it. So you can see there's a level of fear very high among the civilians and exchange of information of fear be between civilians and the members of the security. And you can see presence of security forces moving around the town. And sometimes some of them are situated around the airport. You can see five or seven armed military men sitting in a corner in a particular time and you can see people moving around you can feel that like some of them are members of security who want to hear what people are talking all about and you can see before this crisis patrolling of the police in the town which i think it could have been a very good demonstration that police is trying to provide safety and security but with this political development then the interpretation of the police patrol is taking a negative direction a different interpretation because of this development so the level of fear among the citizens and the members of uniform is very high in juba and specifically outside juba there's a lot of calls for citizens outside juba calling 
people in Juba to confirm how is Juba now? Is Juba heading to 2016? And we get information that some people are already deciding to start planning taking refuge in advance because they want to be caught up like what happened in 2016. To me, this all as a result because there's a silence among our leaders in communicating to the nation this development, what does it mean on the table of their decision making? Are they going back to violence or will they stop this or can they come and address the nation in our various media platforms? What do we see? We have never seen any message of calling for calm, but we have seen messages that are calling for escalation of the situation or messages that are threatened that we are ready to go for bloody war. Even if we are in Juba, we cannot be threatened. Somebody say we have already in war with our partner, they have declared war against us. That's a language, very sharp, positive language for violence rather than a language for de-escalating the situation we're hearing from our leaders and various institutions that our leaders have orders or directives to direct them to speak to the public. What have you been doing in terms of to try to de-escalate the situation among the leaders? As a civil society leader within the country, have you been meeting with any leaders from the international community to talk to them to intervene on this situation? First, with our leaders, we have been interacting with the allies. We know allies of these two principles. We've been communicating with them. We've been running on Friday from one minister to another minister, those ministers which we categorize them as allies of these ministers. And some of them, we can't see them physically, but we interact with them on WhatsApp. We've also been engaging religious leaders because remember, all this development is in the face of uh, two top religious leaders coming to South Sudan, Pope, and then the Archbishop of Canterbury are planning to come to Juba on the 5th to 7th of uh, July, which is like two days prior to our independence. So this development may generate a situation that may lead to suspension of the visit of these two high profile religious leaders. So we'll be running also with our religious leaders, asking them to go and meet the two principles. So the question is everybody that we have been interacting with as nationals are not showing us any indicator that our leaders will really open their doors quickly for influence in terms of really coming the situation because there's a high deficit in trust and confidence among them and they're exchanging very aggressive uh, messages among themselves. But that's what I've done with the nationals. At the regional level, we're able to interact with the Sudan mission in South Sudan, Ugandan mission in South Sudan, and we're able to push. And um, the best is that Ismail Wise was able to leave Djibouti and went to Khartoum and Ismail Wise in Khartoum and we're expecting Ismail Wise to be coming to Juba tomorrow. And we expect also Sudan to send a delegation to Juba tomorrow. So we've been reaching to Sudanese and Ugandan uh, diplomatic missions in South Sudan, we've been speaking to them. Of course, we know that even if we go as far speaking to Tweka, we need to see the immediate neighbors who have influence, the current moment really moment of influence. Of course, with Tweka, they have issued a statement, and then we can see also a lot coming from UN mission in South Sudan as a peacekeeping mission. So all those ones are coming, but primarily we need key players from in that region to get in and also try to reach to East African community, which has been silent for quite long. We've been pushing East African community to really show also a bit of solidarity with the situation in South Sudan. So at least with the rest of God promises that tomorrow Juba will witness good arrival of delegates who will come to talk to our leaders and to calm the situation. But I think still we I'll take this platform to call our religious leaders to reach out to our principles because people like us, our access to our own leaders, it's very hard. Remember, we are their voters, if we still count that the presidency remain under the 2010 elections. So the power of our vote can't give them access to them. So which is really very disturbing, which is that with the power of our vote, we're supposed to speak to them. But we start using media platform, issuing statements and press releases, calling them to meet and to calm the situation and to address the nation. So I expect at least tomorrow, Uganda and Sudan may do something, plus a guard special envoy may do something in Juba. And we may see some positive news coming out of that. But if that doesn't happen, then the fear among the citizens will still continue to rise. The Intergovernmental Authority on Development, abbreviated as IGAD, has played a critical role in South Sudan history. IGAD was created in 1996 to supersede the Intergovernmental Authority on Drought and Development, IGAD, which was founded in 1986. This followed the recurring and severe drought and other natural disasters between 1974 and 1984 that caused widespread famine, ecological degradation, and economic hardship in the East Africa region. Although individual countries made substantial efforts to cope with the situation, 
and received generous support from the international community, the magnitude and extent of the problem are geared strongly for a regional approach to supplement national efforts. The mission of ACAD is as follows, to assist and complement the efforts of the member states through increased cooperation to achieve food security and environmental protection, promotion and maintenance of peace and security in humanitarian affairs and economic cooperation and integration. Does IGAD have the ability to influence South Sudan parties to generally implement the peace agreement? IGAD as an institution is weakened. Why? Because the key players in IGAD instrument or in IGAD uh, platform, that's mainly Ethiopia, which it have its own internal crisis. And you have Sudan have its own internal crisis and Sudan now sits as a chair of IGAD. And you have Uganda where Museven in person have no much interest on South Sudan because he have his internal crisis going on with his opposition like Bob Wine and also recent the development of the death of the speaker. And Kenya is struggling with elections. Djibouti is always a small player in EGAD. Somalia have its own internal crisis. So EGAD in general is an entity. But at least two member states who are an immediate neighbors of South Sudan on behalf of EGAD were entrusted by the agreement as a grantors, and namely that is Sudan and Uganda. And Sudan currently tax the chair of IGA, the two countries can play a role. And we have seen how Burhan recently have been moving. Burhan have gone to Kampala, meet Museven and come with a new proposal for the implementation of chapter two. And then he came to Juba. Unfortunately, our leaders have led us down. When Burhan left Juba less than five days, they decided to confront themselves. So they undermine all the decisions made in the meeting with Burhan. It's until when they confront themselves, until when the SPLIO withdraw, and we see degree coming out for the use of the language, relinquish of power for the SPLIO, which actually the word relinquish of power, for me, it's really problematic in reference to the spirit of the agreement. I don't think it's a language. It's supposed to be reconstitution of the security institutions. And we've seen president issuing decrees of relinquishing powers of deputy IGP, deputy chief of staff for SPLIO and then the other political parties. So I feel for me, they don't act on their own as South Sudanese leaders until they have external pressure like what Ubrahan did. And I'm quite sure with this current developing situation, they will never care to meet because now we're going to almost third or fourth day. There's no sign that presidency is going to meet besides across constituency from civil society, religious leaders, uh, elites, academia, traders in Juba are calling for the leaders to meet at the mechanism of the presidency, but we have never seen any response that presidency is going to meet soon until when we have an external players coming in and we may be expecting soon Sudan and Uganda delegates and it got the special envoy smell why is coming to Juba, maybe that's where the presidency will meet. Without any external player, South Sudanese leaders have no appetite of transitioning the country from violence to peace. The Turkic countries that include United States, United Kingdom, and Norway have called on the signatories of the revitalized peace agreement to expedite the implementation of the peace deal. Here is what Johnny Baxter, the British ambassador to South Sudan had to say. We, the Troika, call for faster implementation of that peace agreement and the need to see visible progress on that. And we received assurances from the chairman of uh, progress. Now, we note that we have heard assurances before, but we heard today a commitment to double efforts to implement critical bits of the peace agreement, the most pressing of which are clearly the unification of the uh, necessary unified forces, the unification of command, but also making progress on the inclusive constitution making progress process and critical legislation that has been sitting with Parliament for some time. All parties need to diffuse the situation, all parties need to stand down troops, all parties need to order disengagement. And it is critical, and we agreed with the Chairman, that it is only through a return to dialogue that peace can be achieved, and indeed that lasting peace can be achieved. As not only among the most visible civil society activists within the country, but also a well-informed individual. In your opinion, what do you think is the dynamic of the relationship between President Salva Kiir and First Vice President Dr. Riyak Machar? 
Do the two leaders have any level of trust and confidence amongst each other since they play such a critical role in ensuring the stability of the country? You know, and besides that, the agreement is customized in their name. If you read the agreement, the agreement have defined the precedent for the lifespan of the River Talis Agreement is the Excellency Salva Kermarid, the first vice president throughout the lifespan of the River Talis Agreement is Dr. Wyatt Machar. But I feel the two doesn't have communication that they, have, they can reach consensus for influencing decision for transition the country from the situation we're in now to peace and stability. The two have deficit in trust and confidence. And one thing that reminded me is the interview of the president with the Kenyan journalists, where he say work is unpredictable. And when he was asked if Dr. John Garang is to come alive, he say if Garang, even Garang knows work is unpredictable. This tells you very clear that there's a deficit in trust and confidence between the two principles right from history of the struggle since 1992. I think they need assistance. And that's where bit I need to call upon regional bodies like EGAD and AU. They're supposed to have an ex president to be one of the key players of regional player in Juba, Ada, and RJMEC to make sure that a former president speaks to them because they better listen. Like when Festus Muhai was here, was a bit as a former president of, of, of Botswana, he was able. Boswana was able to influence bit because of his reputation being a former president, or the role by then play by Alpha Konari, the former president of Mali, is AU high representative of South Sudan, Alpha Konari access to both of them was more easier. But the current chair of Igat, who is an interim chair, who is a general from Kenya, not being a former uh, president, his access to the two principles is low. So I think the two principles, his excellence president and Yak Machar have a deficit in trust and confidence that they can't sanction the spoilers around them. Because also, I feel even if they have interest to deliver peace in this country, around them, they have so many spoilers that are more powerful than them and they can sanction their decisions. Because I feel some of it that also, they the two are tired of violence and they the two does not want to end up in history of getting down as people who may be described as a warlords or people who have led South Sudan independence, not meaningful, or they have made South Sudan fail to build state and nation under their leadership, where they're the first leaders in terms of presidency and first vice presidency in the country. But I feel the two have deficit in trust and confidence for working together to deliver the country from the current situation to a stable situation. As a civil society activist, what recommendations should be in place for the effective implementation of the transitional security arrangement? To be honest with you, I've been doing a lot of bit literature review and I've been looking at the papers, position papers presented by the parties during the negotiations since 2013 until 2016. I have huge of papers presented by various parties and specifically I took the presentation on transitional security arrangement. I realized that the way the format of the revitalized peace agreement has been designed between chapter two and chapter one, there was a bit of problem. The problem is that the same leaders in uniform are the same leaders that have the political power under chapter one. So I think one of my recommendation based on my research that I have done recently, looking into various papers presented by various parties that on chapter two, I feel there's a need for separation of chapter two from chapter one, in the sense that you need to first not to invest on anything, first invest in unifying the command structure because you need to have one commander in chief and to have one chief of staff and to have one um, uh, inspector general of police. Once you are able to unify the structure of the command, then the next thing is that disconnect the unification of the forces under a unified structure from the political process. The political process can take its dimension while the security uh, arrangement or the security uh, tasks implementation under chapter two, which require a bit longer period. Because let me tell you, since we start fighting since 1983, we don't have professional army. Yes, we have professional security institutions. So you need to undergo proper process for what is called unification of forces in order for them to end up as a professional army, professional police, professional security requires long period of time. The lifespan of the agreement can't achieve that. Then the best thing you need to do is that separate that from political process so that any political disagreements do not have a direct impact on the security arrangement. And that will happen only when you take chapter two technically under a unified command structure. So whatever politicians disagree should not have impact 
on technical work on implementation of chapter two. So without doing that, even how much you expand the lifespan of the revitalized agreement, still any political disagreement will have direct implication on the security because the security are paying loyalty to the politicians. And specifically in the situation where we are, where fighting become a source of livelihood. This is something that I want to talk about. It is that now South Sudan is turning fighting to become a source of livelihood. That if you don't fight, you can't earn your livelihood. But if you fight, you can earn your livelihood. So this crisis you're seeing in my wood, in Longchuk, in some parts of my wood, some part of Longchuk, some part of Pangak, it's really a struggle for livelihood. It's not a struggle for liberation. So those guys are hungry. At least if you shoot the bullet, you will have an aid coming to you in terms of supporting you, defending somebody's, or using the barrel of the bullet, you can go and loot. So our leaders are taking to a direction where fighting becomes a sort of livelihood. So until you disconnect that particular tent where fighting becomes of livelihood by making professional army where they're well-financed, well-funded, and they're separated from the security arrangement, the lifespan of the agreement or the purpose of the revitalized agreement is still under question, under jeopardy, and it may not be delivered. If you to go for election without a unified command structure, likely violence will break off because everybody want to control the constituency. They belong to, and like even some interpretation are coming out that the support of the defection and the current wrangling over control of some territory among the IU and the SPLM or the SSPDF is specifically a struggle for winning territorial control of constituency uh, prior the forthcoming expected election. So some people are saying actually this violence is escalating because the appetite of elections is becoming more sharp and people want to go to contest in constituents where they directly control them in terms of security strength. So it means if you start using security strength as a determiner for control of political power as sort of livelihood, then likely permanent ceasefire will not hold. You've stated that there are members of the regional community that will be coming to Juba this week. As a civil society activist, what is your objective for this week? Because this week is very critical. While things are you know, starting to escalate, how are you going to ensure that you, know, you work in collaboration with the regional leaders that will be coming here? Even if it's not only the regional leaders, but what are you prepared to do this week? This week, the most important action we need to see is a meeting of the presidency. They need to meet, they need to face each other, His Excellency President and First Vice President and the presidency. And of course, we feel also we need to influence Vice President, uh, High Excellency Mamarabe Kanyandeng to play a role as a mother of the nation there within the presidency to ensure this meeting hold. So comes the regional leaders, no regional leaders coming to Juba still from tomorrow our appeal, our main objective is that the presidency need to meet. And if they meet, they should address the nation with the outcome of their meetings. And we feel that outcome of their meetings is really calling for ceasefire to hold. And after they call for ceasefire to hold, they must make sure that they agree on centralization of command. And three, they should sanction defections. Defections should not be any more entertained. And number four is also to make sure that the other parties and specifically like the IO to start also running a government that is a unified government. So we feel this decision are very important because up to now, we still see there's a parallel governance structures going on. So you need to unify even the governance structure. So the ultimate goal is presidency meeting and at the presidency meeting, calling for ceasefire to hold, agreeing on, on centralization or unification of command and sanctioning defections and then moving forward in terms of the other task of the security arrangement. That is objective, whether we have chance of having regional leaders coming to Juba or not tomorrow, that's objective until Friday. And we expect to influence, to make sure that that particular expectation is delivered within the week. Thank you, Mr. Edmund Yakani, the Executive Director of Community Empowerment for Progress Organization. I thank you for joining me here on Beyond the Headlines. Thank you very much for hosting me. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube page at Sunrise Media.